Hey guys, my name is David. Welcome to Fearless TV. We're so excited you've joined us today. I know this message is going to impact you in such a powerful way. If you've been watching our previous messages or even today, you're just positively impacted or really moved by this message, we encourage you to share it with a friend. Put it on your Facebook, your Instagram story. We want to get the word out about what God is doing through Fearless here in LA. Or if you're saying, hey, how do I further partner with the mission of what Fearless is doing, what God is really doing through our church, in downtown LA, reaching these, these people who don't know Jesus, we have our Fearless Partnerships. It's basically just a group of people who are giving monthly, whether a part of our church or your state's away, and you're just saying, I want to sow into what God is doing. You can give monthly to the vision of Fearless. You can go to fearlessla.com, click on the giving link. There's a whole description in there. I encourage you read about it, pray on it, and just be obedient to the voice of God as He speaks to you. Other than that, check out this amazing message from our pastor. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Psalms 139, verse number one. I, I want you to, I want you to uh, hear this, and I want you to hear this before we move into this, because even uh, whenever we talk about dating or relationships, we'll have this whole crew, and, and maybe you're here because I encourage you not to be that person, but we'll have this whole crew that just kind of goes, man, just help me get through this. You know, they're just, they're gritting their teeth. They want to get back to, let's talk about prayer. Let's talk about, you know, but relationships, I don't, I don't really want to go there. I don't want to deal with that. Maybe because of hurt, maybe because it's just not worked out. Maybe because you're like, dude, I'm whatever age and I'm just not where I want to be. Maybe you got it worked out and you think, oh, I got, I got this one on lock and I need help in these areas. But I want you just to take a deep breath in today before you uh, go deeper into relationships with each other. Uh, we got to we got to receive what God says over us, what what he says to us about relationships. And today, the, the points that I'm going to give, I have seven of them. Obviously, I'm a preacher. Obviously, I talk a lot. Obviously, I'm not going to get through all seven points. So I'm going to try to get through four. Last service, I got through two. Uh, so depends on how much you preach me down, you may get another point. If not, I'm leaving with just the appetizer. That's it. Uh, so because I'm a hollerback preacher. I don't know if you've ever been around a hollerback preacher, but it actually makes me preach better if you holler back. I, I don't. So if I'm preaching bad, it's not my fault. Okay. Y'all got too quiet on me and too stale. You thought this was quiet church. No, this is a loud, life-giving church. I told you, I told you, I told you we're going we're gonna to be so life-giving we shut down the Museum of Death. And guess what? It happened. The Museum of Death last, left last week. It's too much life up in this building. I'm praying they replace it with the Museum of Life. Let's put the Bible right in the middle. Amen. Let's read this. It says, David says this about God. He says, oh, Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. Oh, creepy. <laughs> I don't, man, God knows everything about me. Here's David. And he's he's got to a place where he's actually OK with that. To, to get to a place where you're OK with the fact that God knows everything about you, all your thoughts, all the things you're fearful of, all, all your failures, all your mistakes. This is the place that God wants to bring us in relationship where we are confident to say, God, you know everything about me. And David continues, you know, when I sit, when I stand, when my, you know, when my thoughts, even when I'm far away, you, you see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say before I say it. Oh, wow. This is, this is unique. Lord, you go before me and you follow me. You, you place your hand of blessing on my head. That's, that's the key word in this whole verse, is that you know all this stuff about me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You know when I'm lazy and when I'm active. You know, you know when I'm a bonehead and when I get it right. You, you know all of this, yet... You put your hand of blessing on me. I love in Revelations, John gets his vision of God, all these stars and these people bowing and elders throwing down their crowns. And the one thing that alarms me and moves me is that God says in your right, uh, John says in the book of Revelation, in your right hand, you held seven stars. Can you imagine holding seven stars? 
A star is a burning giant ball of gas. If we got hit with one of them, it might knock our earth out of its atmosphere. It would, everyone would freak out. It's not just this little thing twinkling. God is holding, in the vision, God is holding seven stars in his right hand. Then right after that, John says, and you place your right hand on me. When I, when I see that, I see God doing this, putting down the stars and putting his hand on me. This is what David's saying. He's saying, you know everything about me, yet you choose me. Yet, I don't know if that's alarming to you. Maybe you're perfect. Maybe you got a lot of things down. Maybe you're really good at being a Christian. But for me, as the pastor of this church, I know me. I know my mistakes. I know my failures. I know the text that I didn't send to people. You know that one? You know the bubble? You know it doesn't take people that long to send texts, right? People can text when they're doing this. They can text like this. They can text while they're driving. It doesn't take them that long. What they're doing is writing the things they want to say to you, but then they don't say it. God knows the things you wrote that you never said. Okay, let's take it over. God knows the things you thought you never said. God knows what you've been erasing in the text of your mind. Yet, God goes, I choose you. Before you get too thrown off today, just know you've been chosen. Just know today that if, if no man chooses you, no woman chooses you, no, no roommate chooses, just know to just take a deep breath in today and to know that you have been chosen and called by God. Okay? So David says, you know, you know everything I do. You know when I'm, when I, when I'm far off and, and then you choose me. You put your hand of blessing. And then he says it like this. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I want to give you seven things. Seven things. Well, I'm going to give you four. Got to come back to get the rest. To be continued. Seven things I wish someone would have told me when I was single. Seven things. And maybe you're dating. This is to help you. Maybe you're married. It's still helping me. Maybe you're divorced. It will still help you. Seven things I wish someone would say, hey, Jeremy, here's seven things I want to give you. So number one, if you're taking notes, which all people that end up in great relationships take notes, praise God. See someone not taking notes, don't give them a second date. I'm just saying. Josh? Okay, good. I have ADD, which causes me to blurt out things that I shouldn't blurt out that are in this mind. Lord, erase it. Amen. Psalms 139 lets us know the first thing. And I just want, I want, I want to give you this. Seven things I wish someone would have told me. The first point is, number one, deepen your relationship with God. I wish someone would have grabbed me, shook me. It it wouldn't have mattered if it was while I was dating Christy, while I was dating Susie, or if I was in between. It it wouldn't have mattered. I just wish someone would have got a hold of young Jeremy at 15 when I was trying to impress that girl. And I got in a fight at the water fountain because I wanted her to think I was cool. Or when I was 21 and I was living life for somebody else to like me. I wished while I was insecure and, and, and didn't feel valuable, I wish someone would have grabbed me and said, Jeremy, before you make your list, I want to tell you something. Deepen your relationship with God. And people say it like this, I'm going on a date with God. Now, now let me just tell you, don't say that. That's weird. You're not dating God because God can't be dated. He wants to be married. God, God wants to be, he said, you are the bride, I'm the groom. God, God is not to be dated. You're not going on a date with God. Don't go to a restaurant, sit down and put a chair, empty chair on the other side. And people come up and say, are you waiting on anybody? No, I'm not waiting on anybody. He's been waiting on me. His name is Jesus. He is the provider. He is. Don't say that because you're not on a date with God. God does not drink water. He is not eating low key. Do you understand? 
you're not on a date with God. But here's what I want to tell you. Before you go on a date with others, before you stir up further that relationship, before you get off into La La Land, or if you're already there, before you go any further, deepen your relationship with God. If I could tell you anything, I know it sounds cliche. I know, I, I know, oh, that's what you're supposed to say. You're a pastor. No, no, no. I'm telling you, if you will do this, it will change your whole world. If you will do this, and many people see this and they go, okay, awesome. I'm going to go deep. I love those Christians that are like, man, you know, I've changed churches because I didn't get fed there. I didn't get fed there. What, what, do you, what do you mean fed? You need someone to feed you. Do you need a bib too? Do you want Gerber or you want, look, look, those that are mature know how to eat themselves. <laughs> you didn't feed me. That church isn't deep enough for me. I'm deeper than those thoughts. Oh, relationships? That's surface. Well, maybe you need to get in that, baby, because, right? Look, look uh, deepen your relationship with God. The, the key word here is not deep, because that's what we want, because we want to be prideful, and we want to say we know. We got our theologies down, and we know our book studies, and, oh, you don't know the book of Numbers? I've been reading the book of Numbers since I was five. Can I have your number? No, you can't have my number. I've been reading Exodus, and you need to exit on out, right? I'm just saying. I'm just saying, it's not, this, this point is not about going deep. This point is about the third word in the phrase, relationship. And then we can look at the second word in the phrase, your relationship with God. Like, this is our high call. This is our destiny. This is what we're going to be doing for eternity. Come on, we might as well start right here, right now, saying, God, I'm not just doing this for the sake of being deep. To say, I'm deep. Wow, I know the mysteries of the Godhead. I, I know that I can fathom. I can tell you all the 32 points of, of the, the, the Pentecostal faith. No, no, we don't, we don't care about that. God does not care about your 32 points. God wants relationship with you. It's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. I'm not telling you to go get knowledge of God. I'm telling you to go get wisdom with God. Wisdom is knowledge lived. Wisdom is knowing who God is and walking with him, talking to him. Wisdom is taking the knowledge that you know about God and putting it to test. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a tomato. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you have. See, what the enemy does is he wants to give you a lot of knowledge and he wants you to use that knowledge to beat yourself up. In other words, he wants to keep getting you to put the tomato in the fruit salad. God is big. Oh my gosh, since God is big, I'm small and he must hate me. God is holy. Well, I'm not holy. So God, must, no, no, that's knowledge. That's the knowledge of who God is. Now let's experience it. Let's walk with it. God wants to go deep in relationships with you. And God, ah, God, God, God is not to just be revealed. He's to be experienced. He wants to it, you, he wants you to experience his love. He wants you to know today that, that, you, uh, that, that, that you are out of 10 with him. That's good. When you realize how amazing he is. Look, here's the other thing I want to tell you. It's not just that we're not just going deep. We're going in relationship. With God. Say, why do I have to do that first? With a God who I can't see. With a God who's so perfect. Well, that's exactly why you have to do it first. Because if you can't build relationship with the perfect person, what the heck do you think you're going to do with an imperfect person? If you can't build a relationship with someone who has unconditional love, how in the world are you going to put someone in your life that has conditional love? Look, let me tell you, run, run, run till you get to him. Because when you start getting with him, you start realizing what real relationship should look like. Let me tell you this, ladies. You don't know how a man should treat you till you get next to the one who's perfect. 
When you start getting next to him, you realize what love really is. Love isn't you told me you love me when they're in the back seat of a car and you were hot and heavy. Love is when I can't love you back. Love is when I'm in a bad mood and you still love me anyways. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Look, I know you love me like you love low key, but I need someone to love me in a different way. And God, only God loves me at 10 all the time. You need to know today, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter what you did or didn't do, God's love for you doesn't change. You need to know that. You need to know that you can come to him today all broken, all messed up. Why? Because he says, I am the great physician. When's the last time you went to a great physician not sick? When's the last time you went to the emergency room with everything worked out? God says, come to me. All who are perfect, no, come to me. All who are burdened, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God is lavishing his love on us. In fact, God does not give you love because you earned it. The Bible says that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us in the fact that he commanded his love towards us. God commands his love towards you. Right now, 1 to 10, where are you at with God? I know you know what to say. That's called knowledge. But do you, have you ever experienced the fact that you felt like no one should love you, including God? Who sees when you come and sees when you go and sees your rising and sees your sitting and knows your thoughts. You can't hide from him. And God goes right here, right now. I love you. I love you because my love for you is not based on you. It's based on the price that my son paid on Calvary and he paid it all. I see you through the rose colored glasses of the blood of the perfect lamb that was slain in your place. Come on, God said I got shade on you. And the shade on you is not the kind of shade that everybody else has been throwing. It's the shade of my son's blood that covers you. The perfect life he lived, you inherited it. He imputed it to you. It's called righteousness in right standing with God today and any day you can open up the door and God is still sitting there waiting for relationship while you're making your list of 32 things you need in a man. God's like, I got them all. I got every single one of those. All you got to do is come sit with me. See, when you don't get with God, you don't know what to look with. You don't know what to look for. When you start getting with God, you start going, well, God is patient. God is kind. I'm looking for a man that's been made in his image. I'm looking for a man that has been chiseled away. I'm looking for a woman that knows God and God knows her. I'm looking for his reflection in their face. Come on. I'm just encouraging you today. If you want to be a, a person of great value and worth, you got to begin to say, God, I accept who I'm called to be. I'm called to be in a relationship with you. And when you get close to God, you can actually become whole. See, God's the only one you can get next to and he can tell you something and you can't tell him anything back. Hey, let's work on your time management. Well, what about you, God? You're always angry. I mean, that storm last week. I mean, <laughs> hey, you know, what? Let's, let's work on let's work on your joy. Well, I mean, what about you, God? I need you to get some. New clothes. I mean, what are you going to tell God? When God starts saying, let's, let's work on something. Since when did the person who was being operated get up off the table and try to operate on the doctor? Never. Why do we need to get in relationship with God? Because when somebody else tries to grow you, you spurt back. Hey, you're always late. Well, tsh, I don't like you anyways. You're a fake. Fake friend. Right. As soon as someone points out the speck, we never get it out because they have a log. But when you get next to God, you start getting real vision because God has no logs in his eyes. 
His eyes roam to and fro and they see perfect. And you start going, thank you, God. Get that offense out of me. Get the, at the end of this scripture, David ends up telling God, God, take any, any sin out of my life. Take any of well, When you get next to God, you start begging him to operate on you. You say, God, I see perfection in you and I want to see that perfection in me. Not to be perfect, but I want to look like you. I want to sound like you. I want to walk like you. I want to love like you. Amen. Number two. Number two, I wish someone would have told me when I was single. Live a whole life. Be a whole person. You know, people think like this all the time. Like, if I could just find my other half. I'm just looking for my other half. I'm looking for somebody to complete me. So I'm missing a lot of stuff. Let me, let me let you know this today. You don't have to be missing anything anymore. You don't have to wait for somebody else to come along to fulfill the call of God on your life. God created you to be uniquely whole. God created you to be a whole person. If, if, if you look at me and Christy, let me tell you this. If you wait to be whole, you could miss the person that you're called to marry. You know why? Because me and Christy don't complete each other. We don't even make sense. Two feisty, attitude people in the same house, leaders. We don't complete each other. She doesn't, she's, we're not yin and yang. We're oil and water. We don't even mix. But thank God we have the Holy Spirit. Thank God I wasn't waiting for Christy to be my other half. Thank God she wasn't waiting for me to be. Here. In fact, when we first started dating, we were doing that, but then we had to break up. Broke up for two years because we were trying to find the completion of Jesus in the other person. And we missed it because they weren't called to complete us. In fact, God will curse any relationship you think is called to complete you because only he can complete you. And he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God. Envy is when you want something that's not yours. Jealousy is when you want something that's yours. You are God's, not somebody else. He is the completion to your story. He is the wholeness you're missing. He is the whole in your heart. And only he can feel that. Let me tell you this. Stop waiting around for one day, someday. Live a whole life now. Don't wait till one day. I, one day I would love to do that. One day I would love to do, to do this dream. One day I'll go and I'll, I'll, I'll do pottery with my, my boo. And they'll be, they'll be right there over my shoulders. And, let me encourage you. Go do some pottery right now. Go get out of that house and put it on Instagram. Go Instagram live. Let them watch you digging in that pot. Say, you wish you could be here, but you can't. I don't need you to complete me if you want to come. Over here, you better be whole too. So I'm living a whole life. Make life catch up to you. Don't wait for somebody else. Don't wait for one day. Don't wait if I just had this. See, many people are dead while they're living. I dare you to start living again. I dare you to go outside every once in a while and say, God, what dreams do you have for me? You say, why are you telling us this before you got married? I'm just saying, you, you have a gift right now called life. See, the Bible talks about when you're married, you, you, have, you, have, you have a job. When you have kids, you have a job. Right now, you, if, if you are single in this room, you, you, have a, you, have a, you, have a, you have a gift. I'm not saying marriage isn't a gift, but it's a different kind of gift. It's the kind of gift that takes stewardship. But let me say this, so is singleness. Singleness is a gift. It takes stewardship. If you're single, don't wait for one day I'll live. Start living now. You're not gonna miss somebody. You know what's the most attractive thing? Someone who's whole. Someone who's whole without you. Someone who doesn't need you. That's attractive. Someone that has an interesting life. Someone that has something. Look, I know, I know when you first start dating, it's easy. Like, you could just talk about anything. Like, oh, man, I love how you breathe. Would you breathe a little closer to me? I, I love how you smell. Oh, yeah. I just, and you just talk about stupid things. But, but when, when you're in 30 years... When you're in 40 years, you're not going to be talking about how they breathe. You're going to say, can you get some breath mints? You're going to need a few more things to talk about. Then you look good again. Well, you told me that yesterday and the day before and the day before that. Can we talk about something else? Is there any more to you than you just like me? You're going to tell me that again? Or were you just a... 
We're just sitting and waiting, sitting, soaking and souring. Come on, get out there and live life. Make people catch up to you. Don't wait for him. Don't wait for her. Live a whole life. Two halves don't make a whole. Stop looking for a three-fourths person. You know what? You know what? Don't, and here's the deal. Don't be surprised when you're looking for another half when you get a half. Like, why? I just got a half. I wish they were a whole person. Well, you've been looking for your other half and you found them. They're insecure. They're afraid. They got no, no ability to stand on their own. Why did I get that? Because that's what you looked for. Start looking for a hole. You know how you start looking for a hole? You become whole yourself. You can only look for things that you are. Now, how funny is it that people want something that they aren't? Maybe here should be the way we should do it. You know how people in Christianity, they make the list. Who made a list? Come on, just let me, let me see. I'm not going to hate on you. I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm saying go ahead with your list. Who, who's got a list? Come on, let me see him. Let me see him. And, 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 you know, and, and I'm telling you, maybe, maybe that is a, a way you can cast vision. Let me give you something new for this year. Instead of making a list for them, make a list for you. What are the things you want to become for somebody else? I know it's easy to make a list for them. I want them to work out. I want them to be tall. I, I, want, to, I want them to be smart. I want them to be handsome. I want them to be loving. I want them to be caring. And all of a sudden, here you are, angry, out of shape. No one likes you. Right? Because you know they're not making a list of that over here. So, so if instead of wanting a list, why don't you become a list? You say, well, why would you say that? Because you want to become a whole person. And, and I'm not telling you something you can't do. You can become all that Christ envisioned for your life. Come on, come on. Let me, let me just speak to the married couples for a little bit. Because everybody single wants to be married. And most people that are married want to be single. And they want to be single because their spouse, they have a list that they want their spouse to become and all the things are not. Let me just tell you this. Instead of praying for all the things that your spouse isn't and rehearsing those before God, start declaring over them who they will become and make your own list and say, you know what? Re regardless of what they do, I'm going to become these things for them. I'm going to become a person of my word. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to be forgiving. I'm going to be first to say I'm sorry. Come on, let's become what we want others to be. Let me just put it in a roommate situation. I want my room to, roommate to be clean. I want him to be kind. I want him to pay on time. Okay, good. Do those things. Set the example. Why? Because you're the leader. You be a leader. You have Jesus living inside of you. Watch what happens when you start leading. What God starts doing. He'll start putting people in your life that will follow your lead. If you want something, become what you want. Amen? Live a whole life. Number three. Wow, we got the three today. God is good. Yes, he is. Number three, develop a habit of joy. Not happiness. Develop a habit of joy. Woo! Develop a habit. A habit is something that you choose to do more than one day. Over and over and over. And because you chose to do the same thing over and over and over, it became your habit. And whatever are your habits are ultimately your character. Develop. Notice the words develop because none of us were born with this. It's something you have to develop. No one is just so gifted that they're joyful all the time. If you meet someone that's joyful, it's because they've developed it. They've worked on it. They've trained it. They've told their negative mind, I'm not going to think negative anymore. Because your attitude will determine your altitude. You say, why does altitude matter? Because some storms can't fly at certain levels. Some storms can't fly at certain levels. There is a level for your life, no matter what storm you're in right now, that if you would get a new attitude, it would shift your altitude. And where you used to feel turbulence, you will feel it no more. Let me, let me read you a little scripture, just to, just to uh, if I can find it. There's so many notes in here. Praise God. Thank you for my brain. Thank you, Lord, for making me wonderfully complex. Proverbs 16, 9 says this. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong verse. Wrong verse. I, I thought I found it. I didn't find it. Praise God. Where is it? Where is it? Lord, it is so good. I want it. 
I need it. Oh, 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 oh. It's right here, right here, right here. Philippians 4.4. 4. Look at this. Go there. You want me to go there? I'm going to go there. That's a habit of joy right there. See, I like that. Okay, I'll go there. Read this with me. Ready? One, two, three. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Rejoice in the Lord. When? Always. So how can we rejoice in the Lord sometimes? When, when, do we, when are we called to rejoice in the Lord? And notice Paul's not asking your opinion. He's given you a command. Philippians, to the Philippian church, to the fearless church. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. No, rejoice in the Lord always. Come on, sometimes you got to preach to yourself. Sometimes you got to develop a habit of joy. I don't know. I don't know what your always is. I don't know if you're always is getting sick and being in the hospital. I don't know if you're always is. I'm always broke. I'm always going through this. I'm always being dumped. I'm always being rejoice in the Lord. Good. And then he says this, and I will say it again. Rejoice. You say, well, that's easy for Paul to say. He has to have my life. You know, when Paul wrote this, right? To the Philippians, when he wrote this verse, he was actually in prison, hanging upside down with blood dripping down his forehead, smelling the feces of all the other prisoners while doing the call of God, while running for God, while, while doing what God, while preaching the gospel, while setting people free, God somehow abandoned him and he ended up in this prison. And no, 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 we know God didn't abandon him, but because Paul inside this very prison, while having whip marks on his back for doing the right thing, for going the right way, said, hey, if I can rejoice, you can rejoice. Uh, rejoice again. Rejoice always. Uh, I want wonder what prisoners were sitting inside that cell and said this guy's crazy as he wrote the note to send to the church that were outside the walls not in prison not in chains hiding in fear and he said to the guard will you give this to the philippian church and the guard took it he said i'll just have to read what, what would he say i mean maybe he's angry that they left him maybe he's frustrated that they ditched him and they open it up they go what rejoice, rejoice in the lord always I'll say it again. Rejoice. You know what Paul is telling us here today is that we can rejoice no matter what. See, see what people do is they, they get negative talk. They get negative thoughts. They, they, it's a bombardment. It's an attack. It just comes through all of our minds. Know that even happy, joyful people have negative thoughts, but they are just better at battling those thoughts. I wish someone would have told me this before I was married. I wish someone would have told me this before I had kids. I wish someone would have told me this before they would have said, please start now. It's going to be harder later. So right now, while you have a lot of time, I don't have any time. You don't even know what not having time looks like. Right now, will you still eat hot food? Right now, where you don't have to serve somebody else. Right now, where someone's, someone's not taking money out of your bank account that you raised. Right now, while someone's not looking at everything of your life and judging you, right now, while you're just you, single, practice the habit of joy. Because you're going to need it later. Whatever, whatever level you're at right now, you're going to need to keep, keep instilling that. You need to keep growing in that. And I just encourage you today, as you go through your day, start taking track of all the words you're thinking. Start, start taking track. Start, start writing down some of your thoughts. and See and look at your thoughts and say, are they mostly negative or are they mostly positive? I started doing this. I started realizing, wow, wow, I just got, you ever got on the negative path? You're just a negative and then someone else is getting negative with you and pretty soon you hate everybody. You're like, oh man, I just wish I liked somebody, but I don't like anybody. Everybody messed up this time. <laughs> Me and my wife, we get like that. And, and then some, one of us will finally go, Hey, it's not that bad. I'm like, yeah, it's not. I don't know why we're over here. You just feel like you need to take a shower. And I'm a pastor. I'm actually trying to work on these thoughts. 
And then we write it off like, I'm just being real. I'm just saying how it is. No, no, you're saying how the devil would say it. We're going to start saying how heaven speaks it. Because heaven doesn't operate off of facts. It operates off of truth. Heaven is not looking at what is. It's looking at what can be. It's speaking in faith. Come on, we got to start developing a habit of joy. We got to, you say, well, why do I got to do that? I'm glad you asked. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 36. It says, but I tell you, men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. New Testament 36 says this, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment for every idle word you speak. Notice it doesn't say every negative word because negative is in reverse. What's idle? Sitting still. You know, we're going to give an account, not for just what we did, but for what we said. Every word I spoke over someone that didn't move them forward, I'm going to give an account to God on behalf of. Every word I spoke over my own life that didn't move us. Oh, I, I'm, I'm glad you're just being honest, being real. But, but you know, I, I don't know about you. You're not going to stand with me. I'm going to stand by myself. And I don't want to give an account for just being real. Lord, I, I'm going to repent. Lord, I, I want to speak in joy. I want to speak truth. I want to speak life. I want to speak passion. I want to talk. I want to talk. Even if I don't believe it, I'm going to say it till I believe it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to speak it out over my city. You ever drive through the city and, you know, we live in a city full of just trash. They say, why don't people take care of it? Why, why, why are all these people living in the city and don't do anything? You know what it's like? It's almost like you're at an exhibit or something and you're in your nice bubble car and you're just driving through pain. Wow. And it's, it's hard because you wish you could do something, but I'm just passing through. I'm on my way to do my thing. And, you know, sometimes in my car, I'm like, man, this city, this city sucks. It's difficult. It's like, really? People that obey the law are going to be punished. Well, well someone could set up a, it costs you $10,000 a month to live here. While well, someone could just set up a tent and do whatever they want. And, and it can make you negative. It can make you frustrated with your four jobs. Right? Not if you're wealthy. You can, it's easy. But if you're the middleman, this city will beat you down. And you could get negative. But here's what I, I challenge us to do. I, I want you to start speaking life over our city. So start speaking life over the darkness. Start speaking joy over the darkness. You, you know what the Bible says about joy? I, I love what it says about joy. There's so many scriptures about joy. You probably didn't realize this. It says in Chronicles 16, 27, it says, Splendor and majesty go before him. Strength and joy are his dwelling place. Did you know God dwells in joy? He lives in joy. You want to invite God to live in your world, yet you're not putting joy out. He wants to dwell in joy. You know, joy is a sacrifice. The Bible says in Psalms 27, uh, 6, it says, At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. When you start shouting joy over your world, you're laying down a sacrifice before God. Sometimes it's hard to bring joy to your situation. That's why it's called a sacrifice of praise. Joy can be clothing. I pray that we would be clothed not just in the latest fear of God. We'd be clothed in the latest joy. It says joy can be clothed in Psalms 30, 11. It says, for you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. Wow. You can be anointed with joy. The Bible says in 40, Psalms 45, 7, it says you love righteousness. You hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. God ascends and descends on joy. Joy is the runway. You want God to descend on your life? You better stir up some joy. It says this in Psalms 47.5. God ascends. Look at this. Psalms 47.5. I want you to see this. Do you have that? Psalms 47.5. It says God ascends amongst shouts of joy. Amongst the sounds of the trumpet. So God God comes and lands when we pay thou joy. I want to be people of joy. Look at this. It, it, joy is a command. Psalms 98, 4 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song and music. God is not, he's not begging you to have joy. He's commanding us to have joy. Come on, we got to begin to command our lives. All right, I'm going to be a person of joy. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to choose joy. Psalms, uh, Proverbs 14, 10. You have to get your own joy. You can't share somebody else's. 
You ever, you ever felt like, man, if I just got around joyful people, I could be happier. No, no. God wants to give you your own joy. You are a steward over your own joy. Look at this. Proverbs 14, 10. Each heart knows its own bitterness and no one can share its joy. I can't share my joy with you. I got to have my own joy. This is good news. So you can be in the midst of negative people and still be a person of joy. You can be in a broken place and still have light. Do you understand? I don't need anybody else's joy. In other words, I don't need a significant other to be happy. I can be happy and have joy right here, right now, no matter what they do. Thank you for listening. If you have something you need prayer for, we would love to pray for you. Visit fearlessla.com slash fearless TV to fill out a prayer request or to find more information about Fearless LA.